I'd like to start actually by, by thanking the Naval Academy, the Stockdale Center, and especially Ed Barrett and Karen Ornberg for once again putting together a fabulous, fabulous conference. Um, yeah, thank you very much. Um, my name is Richard Schoenhoven, and, and for my sins, I teach philosophy at West Point, which means in Ed Barrett's mind, he's just called in the B team. Um, I, resist, I was kind of wondering why Ed asked me in particular to do this, especially since there's been all this evidence on role models. Um, but my colleagues from West Point pointed out that negative examples can be um, educational as well. So it's a service I'm happy to provide. Um, it's my very great pleasure to introduce, um, with a cheat sheet of course, two colleagues from Israel, from the Israeli Defense Forces. We have um, Dr. Shani Almog. Um, she is head of research at the Israeli Defense Forces Military Leadership Development School. Um, she's been in, uh, involved for over 12 years in um, issues of military leadership. Um, and her contributions to the field, I'm, I'm given to understand, are, are really quite substantial. She has um, participated in the editing of a book by the former chief of the general staff. Um, she holds a PhD in organizational psychology from Bar Ilan University and two master's degrees in sociology and psychology from the same institution, so obviously a, a real slacker here. Um, her colleague is, is Ayelet Berkovitz. Um, head of, is, she's head of senior ranks assessment at the Israeli Defense Forces Behavioral Science Center. Um, in her current position, she leads the assessment of senior leadership potential. Um, she holds an MA in social organizational psychology from Bar Ilan University as well, and has instructed courses at the IDF College of Behavioral Sciences. So please, if you don't mind, we'll start with um, Dr. Almog, and please give them your kind attention. Thank you. Uh, hi, everyone, and shalom. Um, thank you, Dr. Barrett, for the invitation. Uh, we are both very excited to be here, all the way from Israel. Um, just to comment that we were uh, surprised and happy to find that the speakers before us today and yesterday uh, talked about many subjects that we can easily relate to in the IDF. And uh, we will now talk from the IDF's perspective on assessment and leadership. Okay. Uh, all right, so uh, just to get us started, a few words about the Behavioral Science Center of the IDF. Uh, the department is headed by a lieutenant colonel, and it includes five branches, organizational development branch, leadership development branch, screening and sorting assessment branch, practical research, and in the past year, we've established a six new branch, a people analytic branch. And the department operates throughout the IDF at all stages of the soldiers and the officers' service, um, starting even before the soldier's enlistment and until his retirement. And uh, the department consists mainly of organizational psychologists, most of whom are officers themselves. And over overall, the center includes about 500 professionals and soldiers. And the current presentation is actually a joint lecture that combines two disciplines of the center senior officers assessment and leadership development. Uh, the agenda for this panel, uh, we will talk about what is military leadership in the IDF and how we can measure it, um, as well as what are the main challenges in assessing uh, leadership in commanders. And finally, we will discuss how we can use assessment tools to develop leadership. And we will leave some time for, for questions in the end. Okay, so what you see here is the formal definition of leadership in the IDF. And I think that you can see that uh, this is a very a general definition. Um, any leader can find themselves under this definition, even leaders who do not operate in a military uh, environment, and also commanders who are not required to risk their lives. I think the very main issue in this definition is the centrality, uh, in this definition is the centrality of the mission. The commander always leads in light of the mission and gives direction and motivation in light of the mission and is expected to complete the mission despite whatever circumstances or challenges. And in addition to this definition, there are more elaborated definitions specifically uh, for military leadership. And these definitions describe the image of the military leader. Uh, <clears throat> 
his or her personal characteristics and the way that he or she behaves. And these definitions focus more on how the leader does what he does. How does he motivate his subordinates? How does he lead them to act? Uh, what is the leadership action? And I'm gonna de describe now two of these uh, elaborations. Okay, so this is based on a definition from, 20, uh, from 2013, and it includes a breakdown of five components of the commander's character. Uh, the, the, uh, the five main components are as following. So number one, is a set of personality traits and character, responsibility and set a personal example, be brave, be determined and committed to the mission and lead. And number two is mental and emotional skills. And these include the ability to act under uncertainty, be self-critical and have a good sense of, this, of the situation. Number three is professional and ethical behavior, acting in according to the IDF's moral compass and values Number four is mental and physical resilience, the ability to deal with failure and high self-discipline. And finally, number five is military knowledge and professional ability, learning from personal experience and from others' experience and having a high level of theoretical knowledge. Okay, and what you see here is the officer's character that was defined in 2020. This is a result of a broad project led by the chief of staff, and this project, project was done during 2019. This is, again, a very general definition of the commander's character uh, and expected behavior. It is relevant to all ranks and all operating environments. Um, it's very small and in Hebrew, so I will uh, read the English <laughs> translation for you. Okay. Um, so, a commander, task-oriented, professional, professional and humane, with leadership ability, serves as a personal example, and is responsible for the competence of his unit and the department and, and the department and his abilities. Resilient, with high analytical skills, decision-making ability, and executive ability, even under pressure and in the face of any challenge, with initiative, determination, originality, courage, and striving for excellence. Acts with responsibility and statementship, with a sense of mission to defend the country in accordance to the, with the spirit of the IDF. Serves as a role model in the IDF and in Israeli society. The officer's duties are to initiate, learn, prepare, decide, lead, and execute. Okay, so every officer in the IDF, um, upon completing the officer's course, along with a swearing-in ceremony, signs a document in which he or she commits to fulfill the officer's duties. And uh, the signature serves as a symbolic action. The officer is now part of the command chain of the IDF. Um, there are many points to this uh, statement, but the main point to take from this statement is that commander is first and foremost committed to preparing his unit for a war situation. And this includes qualities related to initiative, resourcefulness, courage, and determination, and perseverance. And the second thing I think you can see is that most of the commander's actions are downwards. That is directed to uh, influence his subordinates rather than his superior, superiors or the environment in general. And furthermore, you can see that there are duties aimed at taking care of his subordinates, both personally and professionally. Uh, so this means that the commander is responsible for his people. This is a, actually a very main characteristic of the commander uh, in the IDF. Uh, so this was just a little bit about what is leadership in the IDF, and now I will pass it on to Major Ayelet to talk a little bit about the assessment processes, and then I'll be back. Uh -huh. okay. okay, so hi, everyone. Um, so my part of the presentation presentation is a bit different from what we just heard before. It's kind of a different perspective of assessing leadership because what I'm about, about to explain is how we choose the candidates and how we try to find those who are most suitable to succeed, uh, to predict those who are most suitable to succeed as commanders. So before we discuss this subject, I want to take a step back and explain about the IDF's recruitment model. Uh, 
Uh, okay, so since the establishment of Israel in 1948, the IDF has been based on a mandatory recruitment model. This means that everyone at the age of 18 is obligated to serve to contribute to the military effort. Since then, and still today, Israel is comprised of many diverse populations, cultures, including immigrants from various countries. Most of the population in Israel enlists, uh, almost all part of the Israeli society. In a country fighting daily for its existence in a compli complicated geographical area, complicated history, the main task of the IDF is to prepare for war, as Shani just mentioned. For that reason, we use the combat soldiers as the model for our expectations of all military positions. Another thing that affects our expectations from officers is that every officer in the IDF should have the qualification to be a commander. So as you can see in the IDF, every officer is required to have a set of abilities, skills, qualities, no matter what role or what position they perform, even if they don't have subordinates, even, even if they're not actually fighting. So this has a great impact on the IDF and of all Israeli society perception of what is required from a commander in the military, what they represent and symbolize, and what values they act according to. In addition, in the IDF, the model is to promote officers from the rank. That means after a short period of time where they get to know the organization, the organization gets to know them. Uh, this way, the advantage is that it's possible to identify who is really suitable to be an officer, both in term of, terms of personal qualities and in terms of professional abilities. abilities. So just to point that out, the IDF's chief of staff has started his career in, as, a, as a soldier in the IDF's paratrooper unit, and he knows from his own experience what difficulties and challenges a soldier entering the military has to go through, uh, what, what the character of an officer should be, you know, from his own exper experience in the tr transition from a soldier to a junior officer to a senior officer to the highest rank. So all this lead us, the people who are in, responsible of measuring, evaluating leadership in the IDF, to base our work on two central principles. The first is that the information regarding each officer's ability is continuously updated and collected throughout their, their years of service. In fact, we start collecting the data even before recruitment. Specifically, we collect data on cognitive abilities and occupational skills, and the reason is to distribute all the population through the organization according to its needs and according to the abilities and compatibility of all the candidates. You know, many candidates in Israel uh, would like to be in technological positions, but not everyone is suitable for that kind of work. And of course, there are many other very important positions that the IDF has to fill, even if they are less popular. So according to the data collected before the recruitment, all the population is, is distributed, and more data is collected along the way during service. The second principle is that the variety of selection and assessment processes are compatible to the number of people in each stage. In early stages where there are thousands of candidates, the processes are compatible for the masses. While the ranks go higher, the processes become more focused. There are also several professional, professional principles on which we follow and care to apply in our selection and assessment processes. The first is a combination between selection tools that measure performance alongside selection tools that measure potential. And this combination gives us the full picture regarding the abilities. The second is investing more effort and more resources in selection processes for unique positions where there's a higher risk of placing an unsuitable officer. For example, selection process for elite units, elite combat units are much more extensive than others. In addition, we try to use selection tools that create equal opportunity for everyone, for all populations to express themselves and show their real capabilities. 
So how do we measure leadership, qualities of leadership in the IDF? Uh, of course, there are many options, many ways to measure leadership abilities, to collect data on people's ability to make decisions, to show resilience, to show initiative, and to manage other people. And the first one I, I will tell you about is tests. Uh, in many selection processes, there are tests such as cognitive tests, strategic planning, data processing, decision making, reliability tests. Most tests have one correct answer and are graded. In the junior officer selection process, we have a test, a kind of unique test that presents a situation, a commander's dilemma, and the candidates must choose the course of action they would take in such a situation. So all the questions were sent to many senior officers in the military, and according to their preferences, the, uh, the best answer and the least good answer were, were chosen in each situa situation. For example, uh, you're an officer on base. During lunch break, you see a group of soldiers sitting next, next to a trash can, talking, laughing, and all the trash is scattered around, around on the floor. What would you do? Tell them to collect all the trash, call their commander and ask them to deal with that, collect it yourself, or go away and ignore it. Who wants to guess the correct answer? Uh, I'll tell you after that. Um, okay, so the next one is personal questionnaire uh, that, are, that are based on the candidate's personal assessment of their own qualities, strengths, weaknesses, and their perception and values as commanders. In those questionnaires, candidates are asked to write about themselves according to guiding questions. Some are more, more direct and explicit, like work experience, special events that help them learn about themselves, conditions they need to fulfill their potential, and others are more implicit. And there's no right or wrong answer in these kind of questionnaires. We just go through the questionnaires and learn about the candidates from their answers. The next one is personal interview. I'm sure you're all familiar with that. And the interaction between the interviewer and interviewee is based on learning from past events and experiences, along with getting to know the qualities, motivations, values of the candidate. The next one is group dynamics. Uh, it's various exercises, mostly discussion or performance exercises, in which candidate gets a mission and must achieve the goal together. Like a little leaderless group discussion, in these exercises we can see which of the candidates take responsibility for leading the group, how decisions are made, how they behave in conditions of uncertainty or changing the rules. The next one is in-basket technique. Uh, it's another option, kind of a simulation of a day in the office, where candidates sit in an office, receive emails, make appointments, undergo interactions with assessors that act as their managers, peers, or subordinates. And this kind of exercise can teach us about managing priorities, decision making, and of course, leadership abilities, like how they set example for others, what the values they uphold, and more. And the last selection tool I want to talk to speak about is the 360 degrees evaluation. It's a feedback given from various people in the officer's environment, such as direct supervisors, colleagues, subordinates. And these evaluations mark the points that stand out in the inter interaction with others, refer to the officer's social skills, managing skills, influence, and values. So, of course, all these examples for selection tools can't stand on their own. Each tool gives us one piece of the puzzle and help us put together the full picture. Most of the selection processes at the various stages include a combination of objective data analysis, like tests and questionnaires, and subjective data analysis. Uh, professional assessors that evaluate the abilities on various dimensions and score the compatibility for the position or for the rank, rank demands. Information about the candidates is collected using various tools, and looking at all the data together completes the picture regarding the candidate's abilities. 
assessment center are an example of this kind of process that combines data from many tools and integrate the data for recommenda recommendation on compatibility level. In the IDF, the main groups that go through assessment centers are candidate from the promotion to level of lieutenant colonel and colonel. This is an actual picture from a big strategic uh, exercise in the lieutenant colonel uh, assessment center. So the process begins from the moment the candidate receives an invitation to the assessment center. At that point, the candidates are instructed to begin preparing themselves by thinking about their motivation for promotion, the abilities and traits they have or don't have, and the abilities and traits that higher command requires. They start asking for feedback from colleagues, from pre previous commanders, collect data about their perceived performance, and learn about themselves. The candidates also participate in an introductor introductory session with the other candidates, where they get to know one another, receive information about the logistics agenda of the assessment center, and they also learn the main concepts and ideas they should know so that all candidates can start, can, be, can begin the assessment process on the same base. And the main goal, main goal for that is to allow everyone to express their true abilities regardless of previous knowledge or experience. So the candidates have the option also to meet with a counselor for a personal preparatory meeting in which they dive deeper into personal issues like concerns about the process, personal strengths, weaknesses, motivations. And this process allows the candidate to be more confident about who they are, what they want to demonstrate during the assessment center. So at the assessment center itself, the candidates go through various exercises, individual, small group, large group, interviews, very intense process. And throughout these days, there are professional assessors that evaluate the candidate performance, a combination of commanders and psychologists. The assessors, uh, the assessors assess their suitability on a list of indicators that express the core of promotion need. So the assumption is that a higher rank is not a little more than the lower rank. It's not just more subordinates, more work, or more responsibility, but rather requires an additional set of specific skills and abilities. So at the end of the assessment center, there is a process of writing an evaluation and determining a compatibility score. When all this is finished, the candidates are invited to a feedback conversation in which they receive the grade and the evaluation. And this conversation, other than letting them get to know their score, is also uh, in order to help the candidates think what they were able or unable to express as they wished, think of the reasons they were perceived the way they were by others. Uh, this conversation can also be the beginning of a learning process, a personal development process, and Shani will explain about, it, explain about it soon. But before that, to demonstrate all the things we spoke about, I want to talk, take, for example, a, a soldier called Dan, He's 20 years old, the youngest of four brothers, all of them are released officers in elite combat units. For the past six months, he has served in an engineering battalion. For years, he knew he would be an officer even before he enlisted because he saw his big brothers and wanted to be like them. Initially, he wanted to enlist in one of the elite units, but he wasn't accepted, so he was assigned to combat engineering. For the last few months, he hasn't really gotten along with the members of the battalion, and it's very difficult for him to continue there. He's looking for any possible way to get out of there, and just then, the opportunity to become an officer arouses. For him, it's kind of an opportunity to escape. So Dan arrives at the officer selection process, passes a day of tests, questionnaires, and reaches the psychology interview stage. When the psychology, psychologist goes through the questionnaires, he sees that Dan's level of neuroticism is higher than average. He expresses somewhat of depressing contact in the assessment. 
He also sees that he has high motivation, high cognitive abilities, and that his commanders recommend him. So at the interview, the psychologist asks Dan about his motivation to become an officer and realizes that Dan thinks about this opportunity as a way out from the place he doesn't like and that he has difficulties with the requirements of the, his position. He also learned that Dan doesn't share his struggles with anyone. So let's think for a minute about the things that can, ha can help Dan as an officer, succeed as an officer, and the things that raises doubts about his suitability. So on the pros come, we have his high motivation, high cognitive abilities, and high performance. It seems that so far he's proven himself. But on the other hand, we have indications of a complicated mental state. We can assume that not getting along with his friends evokes uneasy feelings for him, even some kind of depression. And the fact that he hasn't told anyone about these feelings is also quite concerning, even though it doesn't affect his performance yet. So in such a situation, we can't be confident that Dan can handle and overcome significant command challenges, make decision, decisions with enough consideration, and lead a group of soldiers in a combat condition. So in a situation where we fear that there could be a risk for the individual, for others, and for the organization overall, we recommend postponing the promotion for several months and then reassess. Of course, there are other situations in which we decide at various stages that a candidate is not suitable to be an officer or to be promoted to a higher rank. Uh, for example, people who do not see the needs of others and are too focused on the tasks, people who do not take responsibility for their actions and their decisions, but rather blame others for their mistakes, and of course, unethical behavior like cheating, lying, stealing. It's a great challenge to succeed in identifying these issues, but as we see it, our professional responsibility is not only to mark the places of incompatibility, but also the potential risk. So, of course, there are other challenges, additional challenges in measuring leadership. And the first is that all selection and assessment processes are not real life. The measurement is conducted under laboratory conditions and not reality. How you sail behave or how you behave in a test condition is not necessarily how you behave in reality. So as much as we check the reliability, the validity of all the processes, there's always variance we cannot explain. For example, there are soldiers that went through the officer selection process and were found to be less suitable, but it turns out they have excelled in leading soldiers in real battle. So the next challenge is being able to identify or predict the potential of something that is not yet sufficiently exist, but still has the possibility to develop between features that we're born with and features that can be improved through experience. And the last challenge is in the transition to measuring more senior leadership, where we look for more abstract abilities like forming a vision or strategy and managerial abilities with a broad span of control, uh, that raises the difficulty of measuring them with the existing tools under laboratory condition, and these longer-term processes are much more difficult to assess in a short time. So that's the end of my part, and now Shani will explain about developing leadership in the IDF. Okay, so, uh, so far we've talked a little bit about what is leadership, and now I want to talk about uh, leadership development. And um, as I had explained, beyond the fact that we measure leadership ability uh, of the commanders, we also work with them on developing their leadership. And um, <clears throat> in the IDF, the way we see it, we believe there are six key parts to leadership development. Uh, number one is acquisition of knowledge on leadership and leadership development. This means uh, theories and, and models. And number two is personal awareness. Uh, and this involves introspection of the self, observation and evaluation of the uh, leadership experience. Uh, for example, what experiences have made me become the leader that I am today? 
and drawing conclusions from that. Uh, the point here is actually uh, just getting, helping them get a better understanding of who they are and why they do what they do. And uh, number three is developing and practicing behavioral skills, a variety of skills, uh, communication skills, providing <laughs> feedback, coaching, conflict management, uh, leading teamwork, and so on. Number four is developing the, the commander's self-efficacy and his ability to motivate his subordinates. Number five is uh, leadership development includes working on the commander's perception of his role. Uh, that is uh, what is his internal compass and what is the added value that he specifically brings into the position. Uh, how does he perceive the borders of his responsibility and so on. And finally, number six, leadership development also involves strengthening norms and values. So these are the uh, formal expectation of the organization from the leader, uh, the objective values of the organization. And uh, in leadership development processes, what we do is we work on the connection of the commander um, with, uh, with the values of the organization. How does he relate to them and how does he intend to implement them in his role? Okay, so when we come to develop leadership, we do have some basic assumptions. And the first is that all commanders develop commanders. We have psychologists uh, like us uh, who assist in the process, but part of the commander's, the commander's responsibility is to develop the leadership of his subordinates into commanders themselves. Uh, often in the training processes, we will see a consultant or a psychologist standing next to the um, commander and he has a, a role there, but it's the commander's responsibility to what happens in the room. And the second assumption is that leadership ability is highly dependent on the commander's motivation to lead. Uh, although everyone can have a different starting point, motivation to learn to lead is something that can highly advance the leadership development process. The third assumption is that leadership development will often be done in a group forum. The reason is that leadership includes interaction with others and influence uh, others, influence influencing others, and therefore a group is a relevant format for leadership development. Uh, we will soon see that this is not the only way to develop leadership, but it is a main uh, way. And another assumption is that we work on leadership development at three levels, the leadership of the individual, the group, and the system as a whole. And here in this uh, panel, we will focus mainly on the development of the uh, individual. And a final assumption is that uh, leadership depends on context. Although, uh, as I've showed you, there are very broad and general definitions of what leadership is, we also know that leadership is very different in different situations. So for example, leadership in a battle is not the same as leadership at headquarters, and leadership of technologists is not like leadership of warriors. So when we develop leadership, we do take into account the relevant context uh, in which the commander will be required to act. Okay, so we have a variety of leadership development methods, and uh, you can learn theories of leadership and thus understand a little more about the phenomena that we see on a daily basis. And other methods are more hands-on or active, uh, namely practicing leadership. And we can do this through conversation about cases that have happened, analyze all kinds of situations and the way the leader acted in that situation. And in addition to learning through hypothetical situations, you can learn leadership with role play or just natural uh, group dynamic. And in this case, we can observe the commander's leadership when it occurs and how it unfolds in a certain situation. And uh, this can be in a framework of a role playing game or just uh, a certain situation that happened in the room during uh, a workshop. And as I've said earlier, because uh, leadership is influenced on others, leadership development is often conducted in a group. But I ha however, we do have one-on-one uh, -on -one leadership development sessions as well. Okay, so uh, when working with assessment tools in leadership development, we have some work assumptions. 
And the first is that we use appropriate assessment tools. This means that they have to be up to date and measuring relevant uh, leadership competencies. And the second assumption is b basic motivation of the commander as well as their formal approval. Uh, this means that the psychologist working with the commander will not be able to see the information retrieved from the assessment tool unless the commander will give his uh, formal approval for that. And um, the third assumption is that the tools are in service of the process. This means that if we started a development process and we are working with the assessment tool, but somewhere along the way we see that it does not serve the process, maybe the commander is resistant for some reason or whatever, we would put it aside and just focus on the development <coughs> process. And also the main use that we, uh, the main use of the assessment tool is in setting goals at the start of the process. So usually we would use it to uh, get some information, set goals, and then just put it aside and focus on the development process. Okay. Uh, oh. Okay. Um, so um, one of the tools uh, that we have to identify the points where, it where it's possible to assist the commander is the annual peer evaluation. This is actually the 360 degree uh, tool that Ayelete mentioned. And uh, this tool is anonymous, so everyone has the opportunity to openly and honestly assess the abilities of the people who work below and alongside and above them. And uh, this tool provides us with score on several categories, values, interpersonal relationships, task orientations, and a few more. So um, after we met, uh, Dan, let's meet Dana, and uh, let's take Dana for example. She's 30 years old, and she's a non-combat officer, um, and she's highly evaluated for her organizational skills and professionalism. However, over the past few years, we can see that her interpersonal relationship scores have declined. So this provides us a platform uh, to work with her, and we can start by asking Dana what are the issues that she feels she needs to work on? Um, and together with Dana, we can indicate in personal relationships as something to work on. So um, to start with, we would ask Dana to talk about how she, provide, how she perceives, I'm sorry, uh, the role or the importance of interpersonal relationships in the workplace. What is her attitudes towards uh, coworkers and subordinates? How does she deal with interpersonal um, uh, with uh, personal or professional conflicts, and what does she know about the personal lives of the people that, that work with her? <coughs> what do they know about her? And this uh, involves a very important process of analyzing where the problem really lies. Uh, is Dana's difficulty with subordinates or maybe with peers? Uh, does it happen when she's uh, under pressure or in any other situation? Uh, what does interpersonal relationship means in Dana's eyes? Um, is it being accessible? Is it being open about herself? Maybe just being nice? So after a, an inquiry process, we can start working with Dana. Uh, that is, set personal goals with her. For example, when returning from the weekend, uh, take 30 minutes for just personal conversations with others. And although this task may seem uh, a little bit fake at first, this is just a method that helps behaviors become a positive habit. And uh, because this is an ongoing process, we can also see how this is working out for Dana uh, once completing one of these tasks. Was it like she hoped or was it not? And uh, think together about the next step that she needs to take. Okay, so um, to try and sum things up, uh, there is a specific profile for the military leader in the IDF, and although there is, a, uh, there is a definition of one figure of a leader, we do assume that there are different contexts and different environments in which the leader operates. So accordingly, we try to assess the leader's potential at each stage and the step up that he needs to take, and we make use of a variety of assessment tools and also the information that we have collected about the officer over the years. And, um, I think maybe if there's one thing that uh, we'd like you to remember uh, from this uh, panel is that we look at leadership development and assessment as two sides of the same coin. 
This means that assessments provide us with useful information for the leadership development processes. And when we develop the leadership of the commanders, we help them be better prepared to the next step that they need to be taking in the organization, thus making the assessment more accurate and valid. So uh, thank you so far, and I think we have time for questions. <laughs> So ladies and gentlemen, we have about 15 minutes for questions. Um, let me recognize that our panelists are both brave and capable enough to have delivered this in a, in a language other than their own first language. So please be considered and try to keep your questions reasonably clear. And audible, please. <laughs> <laughs> questions? We need to know the right answer to the quiz. <laughs> <laughs> That's true, that we do. That is interesting. Uh, so actually, the correct answer is not here, so that's a trick question, <laughs> but uh, what the correct answer or the most, um, the best answer is that the officer should go and collect the trash with the group of soldiers. Yeah. <laughs> you, you will all be graded on that. <laughs> In the back, please. Great presentation. Thank you for coming all the way from Israel. You talked about leading is different depending on the context when you're leading technologists or work fighters. But aren't the fundamentals of leadership the same? Um, I think that they are. Um, actually, one of the questions that I've been asked many times is, has leadership changed over the years? And I think it's kind of a different version of the question that you're raising, and I think that basically leadership is leadership, and um, maybe the two main uh, parts, or I don't, I don't have a better word, so parts of leadership is um, how competent the leader is in what he does, and the second thing is how much he cares about his people. So just as an analog, he can, uh, he's able to bring us to the river, and he also lets us drink water from the river. So I think that hasn't changed, and that doesn't change in different contexts. Um, however, I think that, that maybe the way the, the leader does what he does does depend on the context, um, how much he needs to explain what he does, and how much uh, um, the, the maybe how much independence he gives his subordinates, and you know all sorts of things like that do depend on context. So it's really both. <laughs> it, it is the same in different contexts, and it is also a little bit different. Other questions? Please. Uh, thank you for your time. It was really impressive, um, the whole assessment and selection process. My question is, it seems really comprehensive, which I like about that process, but with that, I. I'm assuming it takes a significant amount of time to fully get someone through the whole assessment process. What are some of the drawbacks to, like, first, is it detrimental to getting a significant amount of officers through the pipeline? And what is the idea of doing to, like, address those challenges if those are present? Yeah. Uh -huh. hey. Okay, so, um, I think it really depends on the um, stage that we're talking about. So in Israel, we have mandatory service. This means that everyone has to go through the pipeline of assessment, at least at the, you know, at the beginning of the, I don't know how you say the word, but this is the shape that I'm referring to. So you know, at the beginning, everyone goes through it, and then as we go along, less, fewer and fewer people uh, go through the assessment processes. So I think this is a point that Ayat, uh, Marichi Ayat, referred to when she said that is this um, assessment for the masses or is it just something very specific? So it really depends, I hope this answers your question, but it really depends on the stage that we're talking about and what is the cost of error in the positions that we are talking about. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Major Ordway. Thank you so much for coming. I feel like I came a long way now in six hours. <laughs>
maybe Dan is not being stuck with the very things that we actually want Dan to possibly be before he's stuck with his officer. So someone who's willing to go against him. And I'm sure I'm not giving you a fair characterization of your whole process, but it's just a lot of both regarding Dan. Yeah, that's, that's a great comment because this example is also, it, it's just a quick uh, peek at a kind of imaginary example. Uh, it's not real, uh, but there are, uh, of course, people are m much more complicated than what we just uh, uh, presented here. And uh, of course, the prediction is very difficult. Uh, it, especially when there are people assessing people. Um, so we, we try as much as we can to uh, make the most uh, professional and valid tests we can. Uh, but of course there are mistakes and of course the context is very important. And um, this, this was just a, an example to point things out, but you're right. The, there can be um, mistakes. There can be uh, times where we uh, say that someone is not suitable for a job, but actually has exactly what is needed needed for the job. Thank you. Please, this gentleman here. I think to add on. I'll try to answer. Um, I think that uh, in the IDF, um, everyone knows they have to go through the processes uh, in order to be promoted. So there are not many um, people who challenge this process uh, or uh, don't cooperate with the process. So it's not something we... Um, we have trouble with, I think. Mm -hmm. um, I agree. I think I can add that um, at the Behavioral Science Center, we do have different branches or divisions that uh, one, op one um, is responsible for assessment and another is responsible for leadership development. So I think the fact that we are separated has many disadvantages, uh, but it does have an advantage uh, on the, um, because that we can really uh, have a very clear goal of why we are collecting certain information and what we are asking to do with that information and what are the lands that, are, uh, that we have on when doing our job. So it's pretty different if you're meeting a commander in a situation that is uh, to assess him or develop his leadership and um, also, as I've, as I've briefly mentioned, when we want to use information that we have collected during assessment for something that is other than assessment, then uh, this is something that we uh, get the formal approval of the commander to do. I believe we have time for perhaps one more question. Uh, could I hear, please? Okay. 
so this is a very relevant uh, subject, and this is really ongoing. So you know we're we're working on it. Although there have been different times in Israel with similar challenges, so it's not all that new. And um, the first, I think, and most important principle is that the IDF is over and above any political disagreement or uh, it really focuses on the mission uh, at, at hand. And at the same time, we do know that the soldiers and the officers are also citizens in the country, and of course they are aware, and of course they come from different backgrounds and have different opinions. Uh, so we do try to give them some tools and guidelines to how, um, how to have a productive conversation about what is going on, not express their personal political views, and not get into political uh, discussions at all, but mostly talk about how do I feel about whatever's going on, and how can we be here together as a unit and concentrate on the, mis on the mission or the assignment and uh, do what we need to do. I think it's very clear for officers in the military, in the IDF, that part of their job is to um, unity. to, to um, ma make the, the people feel like they're together, feel, to express the togetherness uh, over every other conflict. And just to add one last thing, I think it was mentioned earlier, uh, focus on the why. So this is really a time to focus on the why and, you know, the, the bigger picture. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, I believe we're unfortunately just about out of time, so please join me in thanking our panelists for an extremely informative presentation. Yeah, Shania, uh, I uh, thank you for making the long trip. I really appreciate it. And uh, we'll just take a 20-minute break and come back on the hour for our last panel, the U.S. Navy and Marines.